the need for organic ear cover was a very important driver in China's decision to begin building its aircraft carrier force. A navy that operates in the distant seas must be able to defend itself there, where it can no longer depend on the land-based air force or rocket force for protection. China's first aircraft carrier, the CNS Liaoning, also known as the Type 001 carrier, is a heavily modified version of an Admiral Kuznetsov-class carrier purchased from Ukraine in 1998, in a partially complete form. The ship was finished in China and commissioned into the PLA-N in 2012. For some, the Liaoning is emblematic of China's increasing influence and prestige. For others, it's represented a first step towards a more powerful and assertive Chinese navy in terms of actual combat capabilities. Thank you for tuning in. In this video, I want to talk about the acquisition and the development of the Type 001 aircraft carrier, the Liaoning. I will focus on the background and the construction process of the ship rather than its combat capabilities. But I will talk about the equipment on board the ship towards the end, including the J-15 carrier fighters. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. The story began in the Nikolaev South shipyard of the former Soviet Union, known officially as Shipyard No. 444, which now lies inside Ukraine under the name the Black Sea Shipyard. On the 6th of December 1985, the warship Riga was laid down as a heavy aircraft carrying cruiser. She was the second ship of the Admiral Kuznetsov class of aircraft carrying cruisers. In their original form, the class was armed with 12 P700 Granite anti-ship cruise missiles, which is a low supersonic missile with a very long range, in addition to their standard complement of 30 combat aircraft. The aircraft cruiser designation was not at all a technicality. It was in fact reflected in their firepower. Under the terms of the 1936 Montra Convention, which regulates the transit of warships through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles Straits into and out of the Black Sea, aircraft carriers heavier than 15,000 tons are not permitted to pass through the Turkish Strait, and this covers virtually all modern aircraft carriers. However, there was no tonnage restriction on other capital ships operated by nations around the Black Sea. Therefore, to allow the Kuznetsov and the earlier Kiev class of Soviet carriers to transit, they were built as a hybrid of aircraft carrier and guided missile cruiser, hence the Russian designation of heavy aircraft carrying cruiser. No other signatories to the Montreux Convention have objected to this designation. Construction proceeded at a brisk pace, as the Soviet shipyard number 444 have had ample experience constructing large capital ships such as the Kiev-class carriers. The Riga was launched in December 1988. In late 1990, she was renamed the Vayak after the Varangian people who were the Viking ancestors of the medieval Russian and Ukrainian city-states, including Novgorod and Kiev. The Vayag was being fitted out when the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. The ship was about two-thirds complete at the time, and lacked electronics, weapons, and aircraft, although it reportedly had functional steam turbine engines. Ownership of the Vayag was transferred to the newly independent state of Ukraine, but construction was halted because of a lack of funding. The very cash-strapped Ukrainian government tried to sell off the unfinished hull of the carrier to Russia, India, and China at a heavily discounted price. While Russia was considered at the time to be the most promising buyer, 
China did in fact send over a naval delegation to inspect the hull. The PLAN was actually quite satisfied with the inspection and recommended a purchase. However, the government in Beijing was not on board with the idea at the time because of geopolitical considerations. Beijing wanted to reduce international tension and pursue friendly relations with the United States at the time. And it's worried that the acquisition of the Vayag would raise the country's military profile by too much. Major General Zheng Ming, a senior member of the PLAN, was part of the delegation and told Shenzhen Television the following, quote, During the trip in 1992, we found that the Vayag was a brand new ship. Everything was completely new, from the armor plating to the other parts. So we suggested that the central government buy the ship and bring it home. But the central government didn't do it because of the political situation at the time." Unquote. In the end, Ukraine was unable to find a buyer for the ship, and she was left to rust and deteriorate by the dockside. However, it turned out that the Chinese Navy has not given up on acquiring the ship. In 1996, a group of senior Navy officers approached a man named Xu Zhenping, a former PLA officer and also a military basketball star who had become a highly successful businessman in Hong Kong. They convinced him to purchase the Vayag using his own personal funds, so it can be transferred to the PLA Navy when the situation becomes more favorable. For this purpose, Xu Zhenping set up a shell company that purportedly wanted to buy the carrier to turn into a floating casino and borrowed a large sum of funds from his personal friends. The PLA Navy reportedly did not have the support of the central government at the time and therefore lacked funding. But it must be noted that while Beijing was wary of the purchase initially, it quickly came around to support the idea, as we shall see. In January 1998, Xu Zhenping arrived in Ukraine and met with the shipyard owners. They negotiated over the course of several days with dozens of bottles of high-strength alcohol consumed in between to smooth the process. This was not an easy negotiation. It's all paid off though. After several alcohol-drenched days, the shipbuilder and the Ukrainian government agreed to sell Xu Zhenping, the aircraft carrier, and the ship's all-important blueprints for the bargain low price of 20 million US dollars. On the 19th of March 1998, the transaction was finalized. As a precaution, Mr. Xu had 40 tons of blueprints for the carrier packed into trucks and moved to China by land. As an aside, the Asian financial crisis in 1999 meant it took him another year to get all the money together. But the final payment of $30 million was made to the shipbuilder in April 1999, including a hefty late charge of $10 million. It turned out that buying the ship was the easy part. The hard part was how to get it back to China. While the ship's four steam turbine engines were part of the purchase, they have been shut down and preserved in Greece, and can only be restored to working order inside a naval shipyard. A fleet of tugboats was hired for the purpose of getting the Vayag to China in one piece. The trouble started when the Turkish government denied permission for the carrier to pass through the Bosphorus Strait. For 16 months, the ship had to be towed around the Black Sea, while Turkey and China negotiated at a government-to-government -government level. Clearly, the Chinese government had a change of heart on the matter, and by this stage was actively supporting the purchase of the carrier. The Sino-US relations took a nosedive when on the 7th of May 1999, the US military 
accidentally bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. In the ensuing fallout, naval modernization was back on the agenda in Beijing. And having an aircraft carrier to deter the US military was seen as more appealing. In August 2001, President Jiang Zemin visited Ankara and agreed to encourage Chinese tourists to visit Turkey and to allow greater access for Turkish goods into China. In return, Turkey allowed the Vayag to transit into the Mediterranean, which was done successfully on the 1st of November. The ship was not allowed to use the Suez Canal because the canal does not permit ships that don't possess its own independent propulsion. As a last resort, the Vayag had to be towed through the Straits of Gibraltar down the coastline of West Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and finally through the Straits of Malacca. The ship and its tugboat fleet arrived in Chinese waters on the 20th of February 2002 and at the Dalian Naval Shipyard in northeast China in March. The journey to get the aircraft carrier from Ukraine to China has been described as mission impossible by the South China Morning Post. A hyperbole perhaps, but still, it, it was an incredible effort. The Vayag was earmarked for a long overdue maintenance and the completion into a modern aircraft carrier. The project engineers spent the next couple of years studying the carrier's blueprints and finalizing the plan for completing the ship. The Vayag was moved to a large dry dock in the Dalian Naval Shipyard in early June 2005. The hull was sandblasted to remove the external layer of metal corrosion and scaffolding were raised around her. Her island was coated with a red marine primer as a treatment to halt further corrosion. The Chinese naval engineers got busy with repairing the wear and tear the ship had incurred over the years and finishing the construction of the hull. In April 2009, the Vayag was moved to another dry dock to reinstall the, the steam turbine engines and other heavy equipment. The superstructure was outfitted with a new radar mast. To prepare for the ship's induction, the PLA Navy built a full-scale mock-up of the carrier at the Wuhan Naval Research Facility to train the future personnel and pilots. The out outfitting of the ship with electronic equipment, radars and weapon systems commenced in late 2010. In July 2011, the Chinese Defense Ministry announced that the aircraft carrier has been properly refitted for quote, scientific research, experimental and training purposes, end quote. The ship began her maiden sea trial on the 10th of August 2011. A total of nine sea trials were conducted by the end of July 2012. On her last trial, the ship successfully operated the takeoff and landing of combat aircraft. In September 2012, the Vayag was officially renamed as the Liaoning, in honor of the province that retrofitted her, and she was commissioned into the PLA Navy. The first J-15 carrier fighter landed on the flight deck one month later. The Liaoning operated as a training and experimental vessel for testing naval aviation technology until 2018, and she was not assigned to any one of China's naval fleets during this period. At some point between 2012 and 2016, the Central Military Commission must have decided to turn the Liaoning from a training ship to a combat-capable ship. In November 2016, the carrier finished a sizable refit and was declared to be combat-ready. During this latest maintenance, the Liaoning had received upgraded aircraft arresting cables 
and arresting nets, improved anti-jamming capabilities, and a larger flight control tower. In mid-December of this year, the PLA Navy staged the first live-fire drill involving the Liaoning. In April 2019, the carrier's executive officer said during a CCTV interview that the Liaoning is shifting from a training and test ship to a combat ship. I believe this process is going faster and faster, and we will achieve our goal very soon. The recent changes will definitely help us get the best out of the ship, improve our training protocols, and boost our combat capabilities even further." Unquote. The Liaoning has taken part in many of the PLA Navy's naval combat exercise, including a recent sortie through the Miyako Strait and the Japanese-held First Island Chain on its way to a training exercise in the Central Pacific. The Liaoning has been assigned and remains the flagship of the PLA Navy's North Sea Fleet, which is headquartered at the Quindale Naval Base. We will briefly cover the basic characteristics of the Liaoning, its equipment, and the J-15 carrier fighter. The Liaoning displaces 59,100 tons at full load, with an overall length of 305 meters, including the flight deck. This is of course much smaller than the supercarriers of the US Navy, because the Liaoning is only a medium carrier, but it is larger than the carriers of the Indian Navy. Propulsion is driven by four geared steam turbine engines, fed with steam generated by eight turbo-pressurized boilers. There are four shafts driving four fixed-pitch propellers. This yields a maximum speed of 32 knots. Endurance at sea is 45 days. Electricity is supplied by six diesel generators. Total complement is 2,626 personnel, including 1,960 crew, 40 fleet command staff, and 626 operating the air wing. The Liaoning is believed to operate 26 J-15 carrier fighters, 12 Z-18 ASW helicopters, and two Harbin Z-9C for search and rescue missions, for a total of 40 aircraft. The fixed-wing aircraft are launched from the carrier's ski jump without an aircraft catapult. As for equipment, the Liaoning currently has a Type 346 S-band active electronically scanned array radar arranged in four multifunctional panels. This radar is known by NATO as the Dragon Eye, although it is believed to be an earlier version than the one used on the Type 52D destroyer. This is supported by a Type 382 E-band passive phased array radar for air search at a longer range. These two radars should give the carrier an aerial detection range and tracking capability similar to a modern destroyer. There is also a Type 760 navigational radar. For ASW detection, there is an SJD-9 hull-mounted sonar. Similar to other aircraft carriers, the Liaoning will of course require the protection of ASW surface assets that have better and more specialized sonars. For self-defense, the Liaoning has three Type 1130 close-in weapon systems, which is a 30mm autocannon with 11 gun barrels, and a reported rate of fire of 11,000 rounds per minute. This weapon is considered to be China's third generation CIWS. According to Chinese television, the Type 1130 is able to intercept incoming anti-ship missiles up to a speed of Mach 4, with a 96% success rate. There is also three HHQ-10 short-range SAM launchers, with 18 SAM missiles in each launcher. An aircraft carrier is of course 
only as good as its air wing. I will do a video on the J-15 because the fighter deserves a deeper look than possible in this video. I will just say here that the J-15 is a capable 4th generation fighter, at least on paper, with some western observers calling it a 4.5th generation fighter. The problem is that the J-15 is rather heavy, and therefore, to be able to launch from a ski jump under its own power, it has to expend considerable internal fuel during takeoff. According to the US Defense Department, this means that the J-15 will have below normal range and armament when operating from the Liaoning carrier. It is suitable only for combat air patrol, as it might not have enough ordnance for anti-shipping strikes. The limited fuel also places the J-15 at a disadvantage compared to US carrier fighters. These problems can be addressed by developing new carrier fighters and by building larger aircraft carriers with better aircraft launch systems. China is doing both. Finally, the question that remains is how the PLA Navy will use the Liaoning during wartime and during peacetime as well. Well, this video is getting rather long, so that might be a topic for another day, and we should talk about the Liaoning and her sister ship, the Shandong, as a single class of ships when discussing how they might be used in the conflict. For now, understand that the Liaoning has been very much outfitted for combat, but just as importantly, it serves as a training platform for the PLA Navy in aircraft carrier operation and in naval aviation. Experienced crewmen and pilots trained on the Liaoning and the Shandong can form the nucleus of China's future Type 003 aircraft carrier. Lastly, the Liaoning is a useful stepping stone into aircraft carrier technology, allowing the Chinese Navy to bypass years of development necessary to build its own carriers, to catch up to the West and to incrementally test and refine the relevant naval technology so that they can be put on future aircraft carriers. One PLA naval officer reportedly said that the acquisition of the Liaoning saved China 15 years of research and development. It's afforded China a leap forward in its naval construction program, which now includes aircraft carriers of exponentially greater capability over the coming decades. This concludes my video on the story of the Type 001 aircraft carrier, the Liaoning. If you liked this video, please do give me a thumb up and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.